I got the approval of your interpreter, so <laughs> for the title. So thank you so much for being with us. If we can give them a round of applause before we start. And then, uh, this panel will be more of a conversation, so I will be asking the same question to all panelists, starting with how have digital technologies helped women workers to organize and campaign for their rights in your experience? Hi, okay, so my full name is Mani Saraswati. Uh, you did quite well with the first. I work in the Gulf states, which comprises Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, um, and Oman, that's six, uh, and the countries of origin. So we look at the countries from where workers come in. Women workers, particularly migrant domestic women workers, when they arrive at these six destination countries, they're all governed by the Kahala system. They're not covered by the labor um, law, which would al allow them a certain degree of freedom and mobility. So what happens is as soon as they arrive, they're trapped in the households of their employer uh, for the entire period of their contract, um, unless they choose to take the risk to leave the households, in which case they can be penalized. But for the period that they are within these households, and when they leave and become irregular, they all do look at social media as a means of connecting with others like them um, to build solidarity in a strange country where they don't know the language, where they don't know the people. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of risk associated with it, which many of the workers themselves don't know. And that is because all of these Gulf countries are surveillance states. They have some of the highest per capita income, I mean investment, in surveillance, digital surveillance, and also physical surveillance. So your digital, digital footprint is being monitored throughout. So you have this thing, an opportunity for migrant women to find their system, to find people like them who can support them. At the same time, it comes at a risk of being arrested and deported. Um, and I must say that of all of the you know, uh, labor market sectors, uh, women have made use of this uh, in the best way possible, probably because there are so few other avenues for them uh, to meet people. And in places like Kuwait, uh, there is a report outside that we have done with GADW. You would see that in places like Kuwait, for instance, uh, the Ethiopian community is very vibrant, regardless of what their uh, documentation status is. And that is because they do tap into the system. Um, and um, I think it's a way of, like, at, at origin, before workers leave, it's good to have a level of digital education to tell them that these opportunities will present itself. But how do you save that? How do you ensure your physical, uh, you know, um, presence is safe, uh, and you're not compromising that in terms of doing something. Just gonna... <laughs> Sweaty. <laughs> Thank you so much, and it is such a pleasure to be here. Um, I will reintroduce myself if that's okay. I said before, my name is Sharon France, and I'm here on behalf of a representation of the national Domestic Workers Alliance. And to answer your question, digital technology is definitely a mean of communication for domestic workers to have their voices to be heard. In the domestic workers industry, women make up a vast majority of the workforce, and the work is extremely isolating. And as we say in the National Domestic Workers Alliance, Domestic work make all other work possible. We experience all sorts of exploitation, um, harassment, and even physical abuse that is still happening today in 2023. So we use technology, digital technology, to um, campaign. We use Zoom. Um, you know, as we all know, there was the the lockdown. Um, as we all know that we could not have come together and to be in the same space and in the same room 
and that's where technology came in. The, the lockdown didn't stop us from campaigning. It didn't stop us from coming together and making our voice be heard. And that's where we use digital technology to our full effect, our full advantage. Um, it is also a way to connect with organization. And during, during the pandemic, as I mentioned, we use that tool to stay connected and to stay informed. The National Domestic Workers Alliance use technology to connect with domestic workers all across the country. We use our social media platform. Uh, webinars are also used as an outlet to engage workers with workforce, education such as interview skills, negotiation, and even helping workers to properly structure their resume. Text messages are also used. Um, Digital ads, we use that to reach workers who are not yet a part of our, of our work. As a tool to highlight and amplify our campaign and to support the petitions or contacting elected officials to make action. Digital technology is accessible because some of us are not able to go to their offices because we are at work, but we are able to participate in the campaign, we are able to spread the word to other workers to call our representative by posting it on our social media platform whilst we are on break. And may I highlight that in the domestic worker industry, some domestic workers are not even given the opportunity to leave, to not even have sick leave, to not even have a break. So, so technology really do help us and make us not feel left out when these campaigns are going on, where we are not given the opportunity to say, can I go, can I, can I make my voice be heard? This is how technology helps because we could still make our influence and make our impact right on our work, even if it's on a toilet break. Just to say, I wanna to go to the bathroom, but really and truly, you're using technology to make an impact. And that's just the truth of what goes on in the industry, but thanks to digital technology, we use it to the best of our advantage, even in the bathroom. Thank you. Thank you. So in answering this question, I also want to preface that for sex workers, there isn't equitable access to digital spaces. So it hasn't been as utilized, depending on whether or not you're somebody who has access because um, internet is available in the community that you're in or not, but in terms of how it has been used, we do have access to digital technology. I'd say that sex workers have been vanguards when it comes to the internet. The internet that we know today is largely based on the expertise and brilliance of sex workers who were using the internet in the late 90s when it was just becoming popular. And they've also been using the internet for organizing and keeping other safe. So it's been a critical tool to share what are called bad date lists. So that's where you have a list of folks who potentially have been harmful to other sex workers and harmful to yourself when you're doing sex work. And you share that within your community. Of course, there's ways that you can share that analog, the you know documents that you're sharing around, but the internet allows it to be more diplomatic <coughs> in the ways that it's available. It opens it up to a larger amount of the community. So that's been a critical use for just staying safe. But then also the internet has been critical for pushing, pushing for policy change when it comes to the criminalization of sex work. So we work within the US context, one of the most carceral countries in the world when it comes to a lot of things, but especially when it comes to policing sex work. So it is currently criminalized to do sex work. It's criminalized to be a client of a sex worker. It's criminalized to provide security for sex workers. It's criminalized to be a manager for sex workers. So there are a lot of ways in which sex workers are penalized by the criminal legal system in this country and in other places. And so the internet has been a really important tool for organizing to change laws that impact sex workers. But I think there's other questions that may come up that will let me answer this more fully, but there's a law here in the United States called sesta Costa, which I know a lot of folks probably are familiar with who do sex work or who are just, you know, existing in this world. It doesn't just impact people who are in this country. It's a law that was 
passed under the guise of anti-trafficking, but that really is a fallacy. It's really been a tool used to target sex workers and make it so the internet is not, a democracy it is not accessible to everyone. And it really has infringed on the democratic process within the United States because we as organizers for sex worker rights don't have equal access to the internet. We can't use social media in the same way that other people can because posts that have anything to do with sex work are being taken off of social media sites, off of websites. So it really limits the scope of organizing. So if we're you know, wanting to pass a bill in New York State where we are right now, there's a decriminalization bill that's up in front of the legislature right now. So we want to get constituents to call in if we're posting on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter about that bill, the reach of those posts is limited. So as much as sex workers have been absolutely at the forefront of using technology in new and innovative ways, the government has also been really trying to tamp down on that and deny people their right to freedom of expression as well. Thank you. Um, so uh, being a person um, representing a trade union of women workers in the common economy and working with women migrant workers for quite some time, migrant workers of Asia and India, uh, I think uh, in the story, as Bonnie was mentioning, the story on the part of the world is different from maybe other parts of the world. The global south is it's completely different because when we have to talk about technology and access to technology, uh, it's important for us you know, to, to understand uh, all the preconditions for access to technology. That is, that is really because the first question will be who we are, where we are coming from, you know, the kind of background, uh, the class, or the race, or caste intersection of, you know, of, of our identity is very important in terms of access. Uh, that is that is the first thing. Because uh, means people, women who have no literacy, no um, who have no such exposure you know, to the outside world in such a case, and you know, for a country like India, where you know, women, especially domestic workers or other informal workers, have to migrate, still uh, you know, every kind of barbarian kind of rule exists that domestic work is banned below 30 years, and you know, the kind of nexus that is illegal nexus that is the carrying on you know, through cheating them, you know, they're forging their passports or uh, in, in that way of age and photograph and all through the illegal migration corridors. Uh, speaking about technology means you know, we have to address issues one by one you know, with, with, with the lot of uh, socio-economic and, and cultural uh, impact on, on that community. And, and the nature of patriarchy that is playing you know, very actively within within this particular group of migration. So um, I think when we talk about uh, access to technology and the ways, of course, we feel that means we, if every time we have the feeling that you know, once a person is in is in trouble, you know, in a different country, and we would have thought, you no, know, if she had a mobile phone with her, you no, know, she had some kind of connection so that we could be able to reach her. That was that that is our dream actually. But to reach that dream, no, it's a long way that we have to go and we have to think about you know, a lot of steps in order to uh, you know, access that. And it's very important that that process is very important because you know we know that capitalist process that is really uh, binding us in a different sense, you no know, really marginalizes this group of women who we talk about migration as rights, we talk about labor rights, we talk about equal rights, but with the group of people and the kind of systems that is followed both in source and both in destination countries, uh, it is it's not easy for you know these people when, when you have something that we were talking in the women's day program, Rola was speaking about you know, we don't need the Pala system anymore. That means you know, once you you are reaching the destination states, you no, know, you are supposed to hand over your Know, all personal things, your documents, your everything, including if you have a phone to the employer, no, then that is a very critical situation that it's we don't have anything. So such systems are are are, are really uh, 
be what, uh, considered as hurdles in this access to technology or intention in the process of migration. So I think maybe we have to think or start thinking from that perspective in order to talk about integration. Thank you. <risa> eh, bueno, yo creo que una de las cosas eh, importantes de resaltar con el tema de las tecnologías es que como mujeres trans latinas, como migrantes, hemos podido pues, hacer muchas cosas que impacten a nuestra comunidad, sobre todo eh, aquí en el área de Nueva York, ¿no? donde trabajamos con los sexos seguidoras, hemos pues, podido alcanzar también muchas compañeras que siguen estando conectadas, desinformadas que siguen teniendo miedo por la persecución, por, por el abuso policial, que muchas veces no entienden eh, cómo el impacto de quedarnos en silencio, quedarnos en silencio también nos invisibiliza y nos sigue también manteniendo o, o, o dándole la razón al sistema en el que vivimos. ¿no? La tecnología ha sido... La tecnología ha sido eh, algo impactante, sobre todo porque pues, yo trabajo en una organización que es liderada por mujeres trans latinx eh, y todos nuestros servicios son en español. Tenemos una comunidad muy grande de trabajadoras sexuales en Nueva York y pues esta es una organización en la que trabajo fue pues, liderada y fundada por una mujer latina migrante y pues que perdimos um, I believe one of the important things that uh, technology has for us as migrants is that it does many things that impact us as society. Here in New York, um, we as sex workers, we have many folks who are undocumented and lack information and who are made afraid and are made invisible by that lack of knowledge. And technology has been very important for us, and I work for an organization that serves many trans Latinx folks. And we are a society of sex workers, and our society was founded by a transgender leader, which was about three years ago. Sí, y es triste decirlo, ¿no? Pero vivimos en un país eh, rico, pero lamentablemente no todas y todos, eh, sobre todo la comunidad latina y las mujeres trans, tenemos acceso, acceso digno y un acceso eh, oportuno y equitativo a, a las tecnologías. Aún hay compañeras que, que no cuentan con, con esa oportunidad de poder acceder plataforma o la tecnología. Y pues estamos luchando contra este, contra este sistema que realmente nos trata de borrar, pero que no va a borrar. We live in a rich country and for many of us who are transgender, we deserve access to the technology, even though the truth is that um, for many reasons some of us can't access that technology. Um, we're struggling against this. Thank you. Uh... I think that a lot has been echoed through the, uh, through the interventions of our panelists. For example, you have uh, spoken, Sonia, about the infrastructure, the structural uh, boundaries that already exist and that are embedded in our sectors of the informal economy and in general, uh, as well with uh, elements such as race, class, uh, caste, etc., that are translated into the virtual space as well, and not only the virtual space, the physical space of what does it entail to be able to access technology, but that when that technology is accessible, uh, it does provide that opening, like shared, shared with us, uh, that would give a moment of freedom and a moment of engagement, and that would counter the isolation that is experienced by a lot of uh, workers that are vulnerable by the system. You have also mentioned uh, the criminalization and the digital footprint, so the repercussions that uh, it would entail sometimes to organize online, where you're trying to create these safer spaces, these virtual spaces uh, for uh, organizing and sharing, uh, as well as uh, the uh, impact of what it means uh, to take that leap of faith and to be the vanguards, like Mariah said, 
of using uh, technology um, as workers in the informal economy. So the next question touches upon that. Uh, how has technology impacted negatively the rights of migrant uh, women specifically? So in which ways uh, does it perpetuate these structural inequalities? Um, how did the increasing digitalization of services and economies lead to uh, further exclusion? Who would like to start? Um, I wonder if I could put, um, as technology and access to communication gets more important, the control over it also is strengthened. So our uh, research in the Gulf region shows up to 60 to 65 percent of domestic workers, female domestic workers, when they enter the country, their phones are confiscated. They do not have access to their telephone, uh, to their mobile phone, um, well into their contract till the families build trust or family uh, or the workers able to negotiate with the families to allow them access to the phone. So forget about access to basic services. Even communication with your families back home is negotiated or uh, moderated through their employers. And we've heard of, you know, uh, we heard here from families in origin countries saying that they haven't been in touch with their daughters or mom, mothers or wives for years because they don't have access to mobile phones. So there's great control. What happens then is when when a crisis occurs, like the pandemic, and all of the Gulf countries uh, shifted almost all of their services online, uh, basic services, primary healthcare services, and introduced contact tracing apps, which already has comes with the risk of surveillance. Domestic workers, again, were not able to access a lot of these uh, serve, um, you know, uh, healthcare services, be it COVID testing, or to register for vaccination by themselves. They were dependent on their employers to do that. Um, and in the best of times, the Gulf, I'm again talking about the Gulf context, uh, these are very rich countries that truly believe that, you know, their wealth is best uh, displayed by digitizing everything, which means when you go to a primary healthcare service, it's all cash-free services. You need to have either a mobile wallet or you need to have a card, neither of which is available to domestic workers who are excluded from the financial system. So there's a growing dependence on employers, even for the simplest of services. And I think this is an issue um, on how technology is impacting them. Of course, it's to their complete credit that they try and overcome that by building that solidarity network that I mentioned. Thank you. So in the domestic worker industry, um, technology have indeed had a big negative effect. Um, so as my partner mentioned, um, the control of abuse of, of using technology where employers would install cameras even to go as far as putting it in bathrooms. Um, getting bugs on your phone, strollers, um, all, all corners of the house. And I would share a little bit and add to what she said. Um, some workers' phones are being taken away, especially for the workers who are new to the country. You are scared because you don't know the country, you don't know where to go. You're on a job and you think to yourself, well, I'm safer here than I am anywhere else. Um, their phones and even documentations have been taken away from them. They can't communicate with families. And I will share with you for a long time ago, my own personal experience, I've had an employer who had cameras all around the house and um, would talk to me through the cameras. Sometimes I would jump because I didn't expect it. Um, and even one time I went to the bathroom and my phone is ringing off the hook. When I answered, the mom of my employer asked me, where are you? We are not seeing you in the camera. I'm in the bathroom. Um, when I came to find out, her entire family phones were connected to the camera. The, 
the father, the, the mother, the, the brother, and that is abuse. What can that do to a person? Anxiety, depression. You could feel so terrible, like, I just want to give up. And it could, it could really damage a person who now come to such a huge country, United States of America, not knowing how to properly navigate themselves, even with the, the trains, Google Maps, having and a lot of workers come here, not even having a family to call. So you could only imagine um, this kind of control and abuse of technology. What can it, what it could do mentally? A person who has never struggled with mental illness or depression now is new to this, but because of lack of conversations from the country that you came from about mental illness, you don't even realize that I'm having a mental breakdown. You don't even realize that I'm having anxiety because coming from certain countries, certain backgrounds, certain cultures, these are not conversations that are being held. So coming here and, and, and experiencing that, it takes a lot and, and domestic workers do fall into depression with this kind of control. Um, work employers even ask, can I check your phone? You know, some of them even link their phone, your services to their services. So it goes beyond our imagination. And I could see some expression in the crowd thinking, does this still happen in 2023? And my question is, absolutely. So when I'm thinking about how technology has negatively impacted migrant sex workers, some of the things that I'll speak to would be significantly alleviated, perhaps solved completely with full decriminalization. Like that will be the drumbeat that I keep beating throughout everything that I say. And that full decriminalization has to include migrant workers. There has to be changes in laws depending on the country that you come from that are inclusive of changes to the immigration laws that make it so that people can get a visa to go and do sex work in a country, that they can regularize their immigration status in a country if they're currently there doing sex work without a certain form of documentation to be working in that country. So the issues that I think of initially are around financial discrimination that migrant workers face when they're trying to open a bank and that sex workers face broadly, even if they have some sort of citizenship or immigration status within a country that because of financial discrimination within the banking industry against people who work within the informal economy generally, that it, that is a real harm and that is something that is exacerbated by financial technology. So as we are moving increasingly to have things be credit-based and not just credit-based, but be based on having a phone that is also like your wallet. So, you know, we're in New York, you can go to the kiosk at the subway and buy a ticket but it is so much easier if you just can use your phone, tap it, and get in. So we are seeing that there are movements towards making everything tech-based, especially when it comes to our finances. If you are somebody who works in an informal economy, who works in a cash-based economy, that your savings are in cash, physical cash, and you are unbanked, all of that technology is not accessible to you. So we see this time and again within the financial sector. Uh, we even see people who are working within Again, I'm speaking from the U.S. context, a decriminalized form of sex work. So you're working online, developing adult content, selling it online, fully legal, still having their bank accounts shut down. And that is devastating. It also means that you can't accrue interest. So if you don't have a savings account and you're not accruing interest on the money that you have, you're in a much more precarious situation. So when COVID hit, we saw that people who were sex workers, especially people who were migrant sex workers who did not have a bank account, that they did not have the savings that were going to get them through a global pandemic. And then in a lot of countries, sex workers could not access the assistance that was available to many other members of their community. That was just gold based discrimination. It was written into the law in the United States that if you work within a sex sector, an adult industry, then you are not able to access assistance. It was devastating. And then, as I was speaking to you before, a lot of the discrimination that happens through censorship, uh, shadow banning, removing posts that have anything to do with sex or sexuality. So when groups were trying to look after themselves, look after each other, and have mutual aid set up because the government wasn't assisting people, that the spread and, and 
access to information about mutual aid, it was less successful because people were being censored online. Um, specific to migrant workers, sex workers, we've seen in the work that we do at Common on IG, we work together at the Sex Workers Project, um, that folks who have done sex work, when they're coming back into the country, um, they have some sort of visa that allows them to come and go from the United States, that they're being profiled, and that we see significantly this happens with trans Latino women who are being profiled as sex workers and having their phones confiscated at ports of entry. So Miami International Airport is one that we flagged as being particularly dangerous, and that because of your phone number, it can be Googled, and then if you have an ad online, that can be seen by law enforcement. That can have direct implications to your immigration status. That can be really like someone signing your death certificate. If you're coming from a country where you are being persecuted, you are living in the United States for the safety of yourself and your family and your community. Um, some of the other things that I think of. Uh, so if somebody is putting adult content online or is advertising online, doing sex work in a digital space, that that information can then also be used against them in an immigration procedure. So again, when we're thinking about decrim, it has to include changes to immigration laws so that people who are doing sex work aren't being um, discriminated against when going through immigration proceedings. This venue that we're here today, CSW, people couldn't get visas because they've done sex work. The U.S. discriminates against people if you've done sex work in the last 10 years. So we need to change the immigration laws as well, and the internet allows law enforcement to more readily access information about people and see if they've been doing sex work. My final point is, even if somebody is being really judicious in their personal security about what they're putting online, if somebody does put something online and somebody else takes that material, say you're putting up videos, you're putting up images of yourself, you're controlling the environment, the websites that you put it on, somebody takes that from you and starts sharing it on another site, of course that's a violation. You've decided what you're doing with your personal content, like it's copyright law infringement. There's so many different things that have happened, but if you're a migrant worker and you are being really careful about where you put that information and then that is being posted by someone else, the repercussions are doubly harmful potentially. <laughs> I would like to continue from what I was saying in the first step because um, when there are systems that, that are brought in, for example, uh, in, uh, within the structural inequalities, um, one thing is no, so now we talk about financial inclusion of people, in financial transactions, financial, uh, in, so uh, the wages should be trans uh, transferred through, through your personal accounts or through or whatever it is. So one of the things that we have experienced in many cases is that means, for example, um, um, the agent sponsor nexus is very strong in that case is because maybe we have been promised through contract uh, a certain amount of money, but, but the thing is that the condition that agent would have put to the migrant domestic worker is that when you get the money, you have to give back this so, so that means, you know, properly, through proper channels, through financial inclusion, you have, you know, maybe yesterday I, we heard in a discussion that when your transactions are made formal, means made through banks, you become uh, you know, formal. Uh, means so, so that is the kind of uh, measurement that is going to happen in this digital world. But on the other side, this kind of, you know, uh, that, that again, that again asks us about how do you understand structure, how do you organize people, you know, addressing the structural inequalities where people, you know, people really have the power to collectively bargain. So, so without that collective bargaining strength, you know, how migrant workers are marginalized or being exploited in this process is, is, is one thing that I would like to put forward. Second, the, the thing is that uh, when you call about uh, no, all migrants should be e-migration. That is something that we are talking about very frequently now. And, uh, and all, all of us, all our data are now electronically entered into the systems. And when we talk about you know, a, a country with uh, you know, a ban on uh, 
um, uh, uh, domestic work below 30 years. Uh, means, but you are there and you are 25 years through your coach passport. Or less. That means where you where you able to electronically register. That is the difference. All migrations we can track, track and trace, as she said. But when it comes to you know, analytical kind of migration, you know, they can use the same technology you know, to, you know, to marginalize this particular people know where this illegal pushing kind of system happens and and nowhere we can find the details of you know, this particular person who are who are it's over my places to illegal channels. So that means on one side the system is very clear. We migrate means we are tracking and the same thing is same thing happens in you know grievance metrics uh, systems. For example India has a system called Madad which is that it is through online uh, registration of grievance papers that any migrant anywhere in the world can register with the portal. Not again, it comes to you know, where are you, your identity, are you legal, are you, legal, are you documented? This, when it, this kind of questions comes, you know, none of these people are able to register any complaints and there are no other decision verification system that is happening. So these are some of the loopholes, you know, when you are not addressing you know, the structural inequalities and structural priorities, you know, migrants and that kind of marginalized groups will be the ones you know, who will be first you know, entering into that you know, that kind of marginalization process and being kept out of technology and environments. <coughs> La tecnología ha impactado de manera negativa en nuestras comunidades, sobre todo las niñas latinas, y a quienes somos migrantes, ¿no? eh, sobre todo las trabajadoras sexuales, en la comunidad que constantemente tenemos que vernos forzadas a, a desplazarnos en nuestros países de origen por la violencia. Eh, pues, como ustedes saben, el tema de, de, de estas discusiones de noticias negativas sobre la comunidad migrante, sobre cómo llegamos a, a Estados Unidos. Eh, también nos ha impactado de manera negativa. ¿no? Hemos visto cómo muchas de nuestras compañeras han sido asesinadas en la frontera eh, por argumentar el temor a la comunidad migrante o argumentar que somos peligrosas cuando nosotras somos las que estamos en peligro constante. Eh, una de las cosas también que hay que resaltar es que pues, el tema de la pandemia eh, pues, resaltó o, o dilató más, ¿no? o disminuyó más como la desigualdad, como aún falta de oportunidades para muchas de nosotras eh, que sigue dejando de lado. Eh, una de las cosas que vivimos aquí en Nueva York fue precisamente que cuando comenzó la pandemia eh, tuvimos que vivir eh, muchas necesidades, tanto de, de alimentos como de, de vivienda. Muchas compañeras han sido desalojadas, ¿no? han sido sacadas de sus apartamentos y nadie habla de esto, nadie dice eh, cómo ha impactado esta desigualdad en el tema del COVID a la la trans y a la comunidad migrante eh, sobre todo. Eh, también creo que la tecnología ha, ha favorecido mucho al, al, al sistema porque no se habla o no se difunde la noticia de cómo eh, el sistema de inmigración también abusa sobre nosotros. ¿no? Seguimos siendo encarceladas, criminalizadas, nadie habla de esto. Muchas veces la tecnología a veces no lo quiere comunicar. Hemos visto cómo se restringen muchas cosas, eh, sobre todo para nuestra comunidad trans como organización eh, latina hemos visto cómo a veces se nos, se nos bloquea en la tecnología cuando queremos hablar sobre la violencia, cuando queremos hablar sobre cómo también el sistema eh, se olvida de, de la existencia de las mujeres trans en Nueva York, sobre todo y en Estados Unidos, ¿no? hablando también desde las compañeras que están haciendo trabajo de la abogacía en el sur o cerca de las fronteras. I believe that one of the things that I want to bring to the table is how um, technology has affected us as immigrants, as sex workers. Um, we've seen a lot of ourselves displaced from our countries for reasons of violence. Um, as you know, this negative coverage of immigrants in the United States has affected us. We've seen our colleagues killed um, under some supposed argument that we are dangerous when in fact we are the ones at risk. Speaking of the pandemic, inequality has been made much more visible and alienation has grown since it started. Um, when the pandemic first started, we had a lot of needs. We needed food, we needed shelter. Many of us were homeless and this inequality had affected us as transgender and immigrant populations as stuff. Uh, 
Um, technology has also affected the system of immigration against us in that we've been jailed. No one talks about this. And um, we as transgender people have been sort of blocked on different forms of media here. One second. Um, one of the other things that I forgot to mention, how technology um, affects us negatively, is one of the other things that employers do. They block list you. They post your name, sometimes pictures, phone numbers on social media platforms, even in mom's group for the neighborhood saying, don't hire you. Um, let's say in the event a worker decided they want to retaliate, I want to leave this job because it's becoming overwhelming. Um, they do these kind of things. And uh, please don't take no offense in what I'm about to say, but it is sad that uh, it is coming from some of the people that we hold in very prestigious positions in our society, like doctors, lawyers, CEO, managers. Um, it is sad. But the people that have degrees, multiple degrees, you would want to know if they don't have any degree at all um, when they do these kinds of stuff. Why would you want to take away somebody else's income? Um, single parent, parents who want to come here and work, have kids back home taking care of their mothers because different cultures do things differently. Um, you would want to do that because somebody decided that I don't no longer want you to torment me. And, and make me feel inadequate. So in, in, in this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna blacklist you, I'm gonna say lies about you on social media. And it is very sad. It's one of the most negative backlash that, that um, domestic workers face because this eventually affects their livelihood. Um, they can't pay their bills and nobody in that area wants to work with them because nobody ever stops to wonder is this the truth or is this a lie? You know, and even people in their caliber believe that that degree of nonsense. So that is that is a very sad truth. In the Gulf theme online platforms, particularly Instagram, um, Facebook, they are being used by agents and employers to sell their domestic workers. Uh, there's been a documentary that's, uh, that was made as well on the online slave market. But the um, US based companies, tech companies, haven't taken action at all um, to monitor or to um, you know, block accounts that are indulging in this kind of trade of human beings online. Um, because this is something that local governments say is not the eye mandate that they can have the most blocked account and you want to come up. Uh, but we don't see social media tech giants based out of the US doing anything significant to reduce this harm. <laughs> Una, una cosa muy importante. Eh, es muy chistoso hablar de esto, como esas tecnologías nos afectan de manera negativa, pero cuando subimos algo a las redes sociales hablando sobre el trabajo sexual, inmediatamente se nos bloquea, pero cuando alguien sube fotos hablando sobre la violencia, sobre armas, en un país como este, se lo permiten, como las plataformas permiten ese tipo de cosas, pero no permiten que las trabajadoras sexuales, las latinas, las migrantes, hacemos la voz, one more thing that's very important, and it's funny to talk about how tech affects us badly, but when we publish something about sex work, it gets almost immediately blocked, but when something is about violence or guns, it is allowed. How can it be the case that things like this are So I echo that as well, that the algorithms that try to recognize violence online are really trained in a very biased manner. Like just recently I tried to report something for racism, it didn't work. The message back says it does not reach our standards. However, when I reported the same post for animal rights, that worked just fine. So, um, and to echo what has been said about these platforms, uh, if they are accessible to the workers, and there is a big if uh, in front of that statement, 
And imagine how accessible they are to the employers, like the experience of share being monitored uh, via a nanny cam that is in strange places and that type of entitlement uh, into the worker's life that um, does not necessarily recognize the profession in itself. Because when you spoke also of criminalization and uh, how the worker is criminalized or how the sector is criminalized and how the technological advances facilitate uh, that process and the incarceration of a lot of workers that bear the burden of the failures of the system that is inherently constructed uh, based on these inequalities that you have discussed here. So uh, you've also mentioned the um, purposeful conflation between trafficking and smuggling and how uh, even in this CSW um, 67, where we're discussing access to technology, some conservative governments are trying to use uh, some provisions in order to decrease uh, freedoms as opposed to use technology uh, in ways that are liberatory for workers to, again, do the conflation of trafficking and smuggling. For instance, in uh, a lot of European governments during the pandemic, um, this technology was used to monitor people and prevent uh, rescuing workers in dangerous situations. And uh, this comes down to the lack of recognition of the work. So as also was said by Sonia uh, earlier, the technological advancement would not necessarily liberate us. It is a prerequisite to have basic rights, social protection, decent work, it's not going to come as a result of these technologies. Uh, my third and last question uh, was about how does this uh, affect the human rights of the workers? Some of you have already touched upon it, uh, but you could still give it a go and respond to one another's uh, interventions as well. Let's start from there. <laughs> Bueno, yo creo que una de las cosas que, mira, por un tiempo, el tiempo de la administración del uno anterior presidente, en el cual <ríe> tuvimos que vivir una, una realidad que hasta el día de hoy nos sigue impactando, ¿no? O sea, no sé si muchos de ustedes conocen sobre Costa y Sexta, que fue, eh, una, fue una de estas cuestiones que nos impactó fuertemente a la comunidad trans, sobre todo a los trabajadores sexuales en Estados Unidos y hasta el día de hoy. ¿no? Muchas compañeras, y me uno a esto porque cuando yo llegué aquí como inmigrante, siendo inmigrante, eh, trabajar en las páginas web era mucho más fácil. Tú pagabas tus 60 dólares y podías hacer tus clientes en el día o en la semana. Ahora las cosas no son iguales. Las cosas han cambiado, hay más restricciones. Hemos visto cómo el impacto eh, y el miedo también que existe para poder este, ejercer nuestro derecho al trabajo, ¿no? Hacer trabajo sexual es un derecho, pero a veces tener estas conversaciones se vuelve también un poco incómodo, eh, no solo frente para nuestra comunidad, sino también para poder decir cuando nuestros clientes nos abusan. Hemos tenido cuestiones en que han habido compañeras que han tenido experiencias negativas con los clientes y nunca han podido denunciarlo, ¿no? Y es precisamente por esto, por la criminalización que se sigue viviendo en Estados Unidos donde, y en Nueva York, donde se habla de una, un estado progresista, eh, somos este, inclusivos, pero realmente en la práctica hay otra cosa. La, la policía sigue aún correteando a las compañeras en las calles, eh, seguimos viendo cómo el exponernos en las páginas web eh, nos hace ponernos también un riesgo, porque no podemos trabajar libremente. I believe that one of the things that, well, um, the administration of a certain unnamed ex-president um, continues today, uh, the legacy of it. Um, one of the issues that has affected us trans sex workers up today, um, you know, when I arrived here, I worked on the web pages and things were different, it was easier. You pay 60 bucks and you get your clients. But this has changed a lot in terms of the fear that people feel because, I mean, doing sex work is my right, but just people feel uncomfortable. I'm talking about things when, um, you know, our clients abuse us or when we have negative experiences and we're afraid to like uh, report them to authorities. Um, in New York, um, 
there's a lot to speak about how we're supposedly progressive and inclusive, but like practically speaking, um, the situation on the ground is really different. Um, you know, cops keep pursuing my colleagues in that company. Um, yeah, um, so, at the person representing a trade union of women workers, I think it's, it's the first thing that we have to think about us, you know, um, whether any such migrant workers have freedom of association. That is, that is very important. So, um, freedom of association gives us um, space to think, space to collectivize uh, and uh, understand the realities, understand the exploitation, and raise our voice against uh, the exploitation, the marginalization, the humiliation that we, we face in this process. So, um, I think many of these processes happening, you know, the, the kind of illegality, uh, uh, you know, the kind of systems that is prominent like the Kapala and, and uh, what the governments you know, are doing because, for example, when governments uh, practice the countries, the source and destination countries, when they try to enter into certain kind of uh, agreements, either bilateral agreements or, or I know, understanding of what it is, you know, without considering the situation of workers you know, and, and proclaiming that they are advanced in the situation trying to enter into relationship with uh, diplomatic relationship into, uh, into the destination countries uh, through trade agreements, through labor agreements. But if the freedom of association or the collective bargaining capacity of the worker is not protected through that processes, that means no, uh, we are talking about human rights violation of you know, people in the world. And another thing is that you know, how, uh, because we know that informality is one of uh, you know, underlying causes now of migration that we can talk about of the illegal kind of migration that we are talking about. So when workers are in informal, that means uh, uh, you know the other system will be very very satisfied that these chances of organizing coming together, kind of kind of understanding will be very less you know, taken to both of those workers. So one of the examples that uh, I would like to say is now for for us, the workers in the South, one of the system that is now becoming more and more popular is that instead of you know, proper visas, uh, work visas, now uh, visiting visas are becoming proper. That means the employers can convince the workers that you, know, you, you don't have to go through these technical channels of labor contracts and all, but you can, we can get a visiting visa for you and you just have to come and we will take care of you. But the workers are not. Uh, realizing that their right as a worker is, will be losing in that process. So they, they cannot bargain or they cannot ask for any such kind of facilities that the so called bilateral or uh, any other kind of agreements that have already happened or the existing labor laws in the countries, in any countries, know that, that promise uh, the workers. So I think uh, these things are very sensitive when we talk about this migration process, all these things, know the informality. I uh, know the, the capitalist system and know the strength of the people on the other side, the systems like the PALA that, that have been prominent in terms of uh, uh, migration and which, which in terms of uh, results in, uh, you know, the migrant workers have to sit or have to stay, you know, hours or days or months for the mercies of the government to come back to get reported, you know. These are all very, very, uh, uh, you know, sensitive issues that we have to address. Migrants are the illegal migrants or migrants with following this kind of patterns are the only communities who undergo all this. So I think uh, when we talk about inclusion, digital inclusion, uh, it is not we are talking about tracking migrants or um, confiscating their um, belongings or their, their personal data, but it is it is it should be the right you know, of the migrants to legally migrate, uh, bargain for their collectively bargaining for their rights, that means organizing at different points has to happen and that kind of negotiation should come out. And I think that digital inclusion should talk about all the systems that, you know, uh, getting sophisticated in different ways so that you can easily um, exploit the workers. Thank you. I just want to uplift again what Liam said, that doing sex work is a right. So that's enshrined in the UDHR, the 
Universal Declaration of Human Rights that you have the right to choose the type of work that you do. And many people choose to do sex work and that is their right. Also within that, choosing the type of work you do is part of having the right to an adequate quality of life. That's your right to housing, your right to food, your right to health care, your right to life itself. And through, or through criminalization, we see that those rights are frequently trampled upon. And in terms of how technology interplays with denying and trampling on the rights of sex workers, we see that in terms of sesta fosta as we talked about, a US-based law that has implications around the world, that because of the way the law is written, it creates new liabilities or platforms for social media to track what users are posting because they're now at the risk of criminal liability, of financial liability for what users are posting. So instead of there being you know, limited removal of content that is specific to trafficking, which is what the lawmakers who passed it would say it was intended for, it was intended to stop trafficking online. online. There are interesting tech companies to be very cautious in what they are removing. But that's not what we're seeing happen. What we're seeing is that large-scale removal of content is occurring. Large-scale censorship is happening. And who's being most harmed is guest sex workers, but specifically people who the algorithms, which are made predominantly by white cis men, are identifying and flagging for removal. So that tends to be BIPOC people who are doing sex work or who aren't, or people who are trans or gender expansive and are posting about sex and sexuality, sexual health, that that content is being removed at higher rates because of these laws that are supposedly about safety, but in reality are about being vindictive against people who are choosing to use their bodies in the ways that they have the right to do. So this is an issue of bodily autonomy. It's also an issue of just you know, security and privacy. So everyone should be in this fight, not just with sex work. Not, it shouldn't just be on sex workers to be in this fight. It should be on everyone because everyone is implicated in what is going to happen as we see more and more laws like sesta fosta passed. So this was just the first one in the US context. It specifically used trafficking as a scapegoat. But we see that there's other bills that are likely to be introduced in the U.S. Congress, introduced in countries around the world. The next one in the U.S. invokes child sexual assault materials, and that's what they're using as a scapegoat to further limit people's ability to have freedom of expression on the internet. So I would say if you see laws like this that invoke things like trafficking, that invoke child protection, really like investigate who they're trying to protect, especially when I look at the laws that are specific to children, it's not about protecting all children. It's not about making sure that all children have access to health information online or safe spaces online. It's about certain children, and it's about really harming LGBTQ children and trans children in particular. And in the United States, increasingly, that community is directly under threat. I yesterday was able to have the opportunity to speak with some of my colleagues in Kenya who recently had a new president came to um, office last year. And they were also speaking to how their LGBTQ communities are being targeted there. And so having online spaces where you can organize and you can build bonds across countries is super critical in, in this moment. And that is being infringed upon by governments across the world. And I would also just call on people from outside of the US, hold the US accountable. Tell your governments to hold the US accountable. We frequently in this country say that we're all about human rights when in fact we are the opposite and we are passing laws that directly harm people and it directly infringe on people's rights. So I just really want to express that and make that clear that this is not the harbinger of human rights. We are not the forebearers on that at all. So um, I think that's critical to, to express in this space. Um, also, as I was in a session across the street earlier on censorship and harassment in online spaces. And again, I didn't hear anyone mention sex workers as human rights defenders who are being censored and harassed online. I didn't hear any of the stories of just supposed solutions to addressing censorship and harassment actually addressing the fact that a lot of these alleged solutions lead to sex workers being censored at higher rates. So again, just if you see solutions to these issues, especially when it comes to tech, 
just really investigate and go to the people that you know are experts. Talk to sex workers who are experts on all of these topics. Uh, there's many sex worker-led organizations that you can look to as leaders because they are. Thank you. Um, so I'll add on the question that works and how does this impact their human rights? Well, in the domestic worker industry, as I mentioned a lot of things before um, about workers not being able to use their phones um, uh, to contact families because um, they're traffic, right? They're locked in on a job, can't use their phone. My, my thing is, if an employer could use their phone on a job, who says that it's not the right of their in, uh, employee? to use their phone, um, the abuse of them being on that camera talking to you and jumping you out of your body every two seconds, what does, do, do the employee not have the same right to use it? It's the double standard that's, that's crazy. Um, so it really do affect um, domestic workers because you're saying to me that you have all the rights except for me. Um, and that could only be because you have placed domestic workers in a box, um, thinking that there are lower class of people, they're not deserving um, of fair treatment, uh, of the same opportunities. And I think that is very, very much unfair. Um, I think every person should have the right to use their phone as their employer would be able to um, what gives you the right to call every 50 minutes to know how your child is doing? But that person cannot call from to another country, a whole other country, to know how their child is do, doing just for five minutes. But you're in the same country as me, probably 40 minutes drive away from the house. But you are you have every right to call every second and call, but one, the same thing I say on the phone, on a paper. And even for me to enter it on uh, an app that you might leave on an iPad for me to do it, but that worker don't have that same right to take a couple of minutes to say, how is my child doing, or is my mother okay? So that really do affect that person human right because they are entitled to it as much as you think that you're entitled to it yourself. So we have mentioned uh, across the Gulf states, there's no right to association. There's no freedom of association. There are no trade unions. There are no civil society organizations. Um, and not just for migrant workers or for domestic workers. In general, the civil society space across the Gulf is non-existent. Uh, probably in Bahrain and Kuwait, it is there to an extent, focusing more on citizens. So given this situation, um, both migrant workers themselves within the country and their allies outside their country have to depend on technology to mobilize them, technology to organize them. There's no way around it. There's no way of doing it offline in a safe manner, which means that we have to ensure that there is uh, digital security training, there is education of migrant women and migrant workers, uh, domestic workers, because they are very quick to pick up on technology on how to use social media, how to use the phone. Even those who are not formally educated do take to technology very easily. So it won't be a hard task to then talk about uh, how to continue the activism online by securing themselves. The reason I mentioned that is we've already spoken about, I already mentioned the investments that are made in surveillance, digital surveillance in the Gulf, the phishing attacks. We've had members of the migrant workers community being targeted for the activism, even when they're aware of the risks through these phishing attacks. So the only thing that I would say is for us to see how we could improve uh, the education for them to protect themselves because there's really no way of escaping the uh, control technology has over our lives now, uh, just to ensure that it's a safe space as much as possible. Um, technology is used actively, but
by all of these governments, governments which are, um, you know, monarchies, uh, authoritarian governments, they use technology to suppress any kind of dissent. Um, while technology is what, you know, helps the dissent itself. So we need to counter them in their own way. Thank you. So um, often uh, we are told that the government is trying to protect women or employers are trying to protect women. Women need no protect or migrants' rights that need to be protected as opposed to women. And uh, from that patriarchal, like sexist standpoint that usually we are presented with, and I think this panel um, speaks truth to justice in that sense. We have about 20 minutes for Q&A. And I would like to remind you kindly, as my colleague Maya said earlier, that if you have a hostile question to ask, please don't. You don't want that digital footprint. We are being live streamed. So, um, questions? Um, first off, I want to say thank you to the panel for uh, this informative discussion. Um, when I came tonight, I didn't think I was going to learn as much as I did, but that's why I chose to come. I read something in a newsletter today, and it was kind of shocking, but it said that for every event of that get promoted to manager, I'm like 67, but you should get that same opportunity. So I was thinking. In terms of financial discrimination, um, I work as a financial planner, and I just wanted to know, do you guys have any current initiatives or programs centered towards helping um, women workers to financial literacy or how to better fight or challenge the discrimination in the face of trying to bank accounts, life insurance, even uh, health insurance, like basic, you know, necessities that a person needs, like what resources you guys have. If you do, how are you able to connect or uh, get back to those? Maybe we will take two more and then uh, give them back to the panel. Hi, um, my name is Francisca Ibercat, and I know my it's a domestic worker that organization in Lebanon that serves my domestic workers. So my question is mostly oriented to people from the region. Um, and it comes from a bit of a dark place. So is there hope at all for migrant domestic worker women in the region? And um, that's in light of, you know, um, as you mentioned, access limitations and um, surveillance that domestic workers are subject to both by the state and by their employers and also I'm thinking about like recent crackdowns against domestic worker activists in Lebanon. So if there is hope if <laughs> there is hope, does technology play a role in protecting domestic worker women at all? One more Okay. Yes. Thank you all so much. I think this was very important. For once, we were talking about sex work. My mind was all over the place. I was thinking sex work. Is it <coughs> sex work? Sex work on a broad scale of like changing your sex? And can I have like a definition of sex work itself? Thank you. Uh, who would like to start with the answers? Hi, Francesca. Uh, great admirer of your work. Uh, I would say as long as the um, only mode of employment currently, Lebanon, Jordan, and the Gulf states that are all covered by the, covered by the Kafala, the only mode of my uh, domestic work is living domestic work. There is no legal alternative. And as long as that's the case, I don't think there's any more. If you're bringing in women in the, across continents and trapping them within households, making them completely dependent on the employer for everything, and they can't leave the home at the end of their work day or get an off day or leave an off day, then I really don't think we can even as hope for a significant change. There has to be a break in that monopoly. And that could come in 
by way of a regional negotiation, you know, um, and Sonia was talking about bilateral agreements, multilateral agreements, regional processes, to say that you cannot have this. It has to be the domestic worker's choice to be a living employee. And if they don't, if they don't wish to be that, if they should have the liberty to live outside, then go into the homes. That gives them a lot more freedom. Uh, so I think that is the issue. And once that is in place, then technology can be leveraged in, in creating a job market, a job market by the workers themselves. Does that answer your question? Um, I have um, my opinion on whether there is hope. I say there is hope. And I'll tell you why there is hope, because there are organizations like the National Domestic Workers Alliance who are always fighting to bring changes and equality to the domestic workers industry. Before today, workers were not entitled to paid sick days. Due to the fight, workers are now by law entitled to three paid sick days for New York. Different states vary. Um, laws have change workers are now um, being able to fight their employers for which that um for instance let's say i work with you and i the, the work relationship ended i have six years um after i would have left that work that time span given by law to fight to get my wages back and i will get my wages back um, so I see a lot of hope. I domestic workers have been fighting getting their monies back. Two weeks paid vacation time. We never had stuff like that before. And that is why I mentioned before that with the webinars that the National Domestic Workers Alliance usually keep, you will find it on our Facebook um, page. Um, we teach you how to construct your contract to include these things inside. Um, so that your employers, so raising these awareness, that's why we go into the park and we um, share everything that's going on in, in our organization, because that's how we get to make contact with workers out there. And a worker would say things like, I never know this. I want you to know there are workers who are still getting paid below minimum wage, which is against the law in New York. Whether you are documented or undocumented, yes. you must be paid a minimum of $15 an hour. So I want to say, I see hope, I feel hope, and I experience the hope because we have come a far way from our people like Dorothy Bolden who have fought a good fight. So we are... We have the same vision Dorothy has. We just add new passion to it, right? And we march differently now. Like technology is one of the roads that we use to march all the way to Congress. So my dear, there is a whole lot of hope. And if you want to know, you will see hope in all different shapes, colors, and forms because we would not Stop until we bring full equality to this domestic workers industry, shutting down <laughs> employers and agency who think that they have every right to exploit another human being. El trabajo sexual, bueno, para mí me dificultó para trabajo sexual, algo para sobrevivir, algo para poder pues, subsistir en una ciudad tan costosa como Nueva York. La renta es muy cara, los vídeos son muy caros, la salud es muy cara, físicamente es limitada. No tengo, muchas veces ni siquiera tengo acceso a la salud, que es algo tan básico. Y es la manera de poder eh, conseguir alguna remuneración por. Eh, consentir a mis clientes y no, no tiene nada que ver con mi identidad de género o con mi trabajo sexual. Eh, so, it doesn't have anything to do with um, sex change. Sex work for me is the definition of what I do. 
exist and how, how I survive in such a costly city like New York City where everything is very expensive. Um, I don't even have access to healthcare and, and how I get remuneration. And anyone can do sex work independent of your gender identity or sexual La identidad de género? Ah, pues. Oh. Oh. Bueno, yo soy una mujer trans, soy. Eh, yo nací eh, determinada por el sistema como un nene, pero yo eh, transicioné mi vida, decidí que no me identificaba como un hombre, sino como una mujer. I was born designated as a male, my birth certificate, um, but I did uh, this transition, I identified as a male. Entonces, para que entiendan la definición de que es ser una persona, una mujer trans, yo soy una mujer trans, pero siempre me he identificado como una mujer. So that you understand what the definition of a transgender woman is. I'm a transgender woman, I've always identified. Y la identidad, pues, puede ser de distintas maneras. O sea, hay muchas personas que son género no binario, género queer, identidad de queer, hay personas que se identifican eh, como de cualquier otra identidad, pero yo creo que aquí el tema es que. Eh, tenemos que aprender a respetar y valorar también las identidades de cada individuo. Gender can come in all different um, sizes and shapes. There are folks that identify as non-binary, there are folks that identify as gender queer, and others if we have to talk about gender So there is one more question about finances. Uh, actually, we, have, we are talking about non for for the migrant worker, for being a worker, no, uh, employers have certain responsibilities, no, regarding our insurance or medical insurance or whatever it is. So that is what we are fighting for. It is, it is the responsibility of employers for social protection of the workers, means if it, even if it's a domestic worker. So most of the migrant workers, no, even none of these uh, agreements that the countries have, you know, they don't speak about social My responsibility. I may take or may not take, I may not have no, I may not have enough money to have access to all such things. But uh, the state or the, or the state has certain responsibilities to take care of my uh, social protection. So I think we are looking at from uh, it, from that aspect of inclusion. That is what we, we talk about. And just from you know, your question in relation to financial planning and financial literacy when it comes to people who are doing sex work, and also somewhat to add on to what Liam said in the definition of what sex work is. Again, I come from the U.S. context, so some of the stuff I think of when I'm defining what sex work is when I'm talking to people, and I really appreciate that question because I think that's glossed over in conversation and also in writing that we just use the term sex work, and it's a an umbrella term and it can mean many things and it can mean different things for different people. So part of the calculation here in the United States is to consider the different forms of criminalization that happen within the sex trades and different types of sex work are criminalized in different ways or regulated in different ways. So there's sex work if you're you know working online camming that would be fully legal. There's sex work in person, <coughs> full service sex work in the state of Nevada in certain counties with low population, so not Las Vegas, not Reno, but other places where you can do full service in-person sex work in brothels, but there's a lot of problems with that model because it ends up being that an individual manages that brothel and you control on who they employ. So if you're not working within that setting, then the work that you're doing is still criminalized, so it's still really harmful, and it also does not provide opportunities for people who are migrant workers. Um, and then there's also other types of work within sexual services that people might apply the term sex work to. That could be stripping in a club. 
club. It could be providing erotic massage. So it's a really expansive field, um, and it can mean a lot of things. Um, so I just want to also ground the conversation with that. And then in terms of financial literacy, I know there's some folks in the audience here who are my colleagues in this work. And so the organizations that they work with might have other resources. So if I can, I'd say just um, BPPP and NSWP, the Global Network of Sex Worker Projects, Ishtar Collective. So the folks that are here from those organizations might have other advice in terms of financial literacy programs that their organizations run or are aware of. Um, but one of the issues we run up against, so I've had conversations with um, amalgamated banks. Um, there are banks that would be open to having services for sex workers, but because of the way that criminalization exists, there's a lot of liability for banks to provide services to sex workers. And so again, as I said, like we need decriminalization so that people can access banking systems so that they can be part of the formal banking system. I mean, myriad of problems within that as well. But again, financial literacy is going to look different for people who are working within informal cash-based economies. So that's a calculation if you're thinking through, like, how can you support somebody who's working within an informal economy in terms of financial literacy? I would also say that sex workers are experts on navigating the financial systems because of necessity. Um, so I would also say that you know, look to them as experts in being able to navigate these systems that really are built to exclude them. Um, there's another group, Center for LGBTQ Economic Advancement and Research. So they've been putting together a um, credit union specifically geared towards people who have previously experienced incarceration. So it's not specific to sex workers, but again, one of the stumbling blocks that they've come upon is as a criminal breach in sex work and because of the way it's criminalized, that it's been really difficult for them to be able to provide this like really necessary service for people who do sex work. So um, those are just sort of my like initial thoughts. We also have a tax, uh, how to do taxes as a sex worker fact sheet on our website that we're updating. So there are like resources like that. Every year I see um, some of the SWAP chapters, the sex worker outreach project chapters doing like webinars around tax season on like if you're doing sex work, here's how to do your taxes. Um, so yeah, those are just some of the thoughts I have. Also within the National Domestic Workers Alliance, we bring financial organizations to educate our domestic workers um, on finances, retirement, taxes, and different financial strategies out there, um, including all types of insurance and emergency funding. Um, I think most of you would know. Are we going to wrap up because I see my time lady has been sitting with us. <laughs> but in the domestic worker industry, thank you so much. You're so great at timing. Um, in the domestic worker industry, there's not um, a retirement plan for us, no 401k and all that. So that's why within the organization, we are educating workers on how to set up themselves for after work. And I'll say this before I close. I want to mention the word hope to my girl at the back and my friend here. The Bible said faith is the substance of things hoped for, but yet it's the evidence of things That's not seen. Hope is the beginning of your faith. So if you ever let somebody like the devil steal your hope, he steals the faith in whatever you're marching for. So that's why in the domestic workers industry, our hope is always at the top because our hope is the foundation of the faith in which we fight for what we want for the industry. Don't ever let anything kill your hope. Time, ladies, telling us we are uh, wrapping up right now. And since in the beginning of the session, I was busy being starstruck by our panel, I forgot to introduce myself. So here we go. Lula Segayer from the International Domestic Workers Federation. We are a global membership based federation of domestic worker unions. And um, speaking of workers' rights, um, we are trying to unite workers, domestic workers specifically, all over the world and to do it from an intersectional perspective. Today here, there have been questions about migration, about xenophobia, about race, about gender. Um, 
I want to say we recently were joined by a domestic worker organization that is made of transgender women uh, who engage in the sector. They are based in Nicaragua. And this is because people who engage in an informal economy uh, in general come from structural inequalities that make a lot of formalized sectors inaccessible. So uh, we are together, we are united, we are strong. I would like to thank Vani Saraswati from the Migrants' uh, Rights. I would like to thank Shik Fran from the National Domestic Workers Alliance, Mariah Dan from the Urban Justice Center, Sonia George from the Self-Employed Women's Association, and Ian Grant from the Political Council. Okay, wonderful. And thank you so much for our audience for engaging with us and for your wonderful questions. It has been great.